Welcome back, Algebra Express. We are in Roxwell 5.2 today. We are going to start talking about inverse functions. So we have mentioned inverse functions and how to inverse sort of things in class before, but we are going to sort of formalize it today. We're talking about it with this section. Uh, we're going to talk about how to talk. Well, we're going to talk about what an inverse is. We're going to talk about how to find inverses and how to determine if something is an inverse. So if we look at this, and we use a lot of things in math, um, a lot of properties in math. So we talked about a few of these before, but if I have A times B, that's the same thing, thing as B times A, this would be how they get to the problem or how they commute to the problem. So this would be commutivity. And we get this with multiplication, we get this with what, addition. The other property we really like to talk about is who they're associating with. So if A and B are associating there, B and C are associating with each other here, but it doesn't matter what order we multiply these things in. So I know I'm giving you letters, but if you wanted to throw some numbers in here, five times six times uh, nine might be a good one. Five times six times nine. This would be 30 times 9. This would be 5 times what, 54. We should always get the same thing. This is 270. 20, 25 plus 2 gives me the 270. And I said it, but this is the associativity property. So this is who they are associating with. So we call this associativity. So we can think about these properties with like numbers and sets, sets of numbers, but we can also just sort of generalize these sorts of things. So math is an application application of logic to numerical sets, but we can use the same sort of logic and talk about commutivity with other sets of things like your socks and your shoes. So if I put on my socks and put on my shoes, usually we use this example when we start talking about commutivity. So if you put on your socks and shoes, is that the same thing as putting on your shoes and socks? No order matters here. So these are not commutative, right? Um, so if we want to inverse this, now we're talking about something a little different. We want to basically undo what we're doing. So if we put on our socks and shoes, if you take off your socks before your shoes, I think you might be, uh, on your route to becoming a magician or something, I'm not sure, but definitely not a mathematician, more of a magician sort of thing. So most people take off their shoes first. Then take off socks. So there are maybe two sort of things to notice. When I put on my shoes to undo that, I take off my shoes. So those one thing is I have to like undo the operation. So if this is putting on, this is taking off. The other thing is the order in which I did things. So if I put on my socks and then I put on my shoes, I have to inverse this in the inverse order of what this is in, right? So I have to do my shoes before I do my socks. If you do it the other way around, that was the thing I was saying. You're performing magic then, right? Mm, that's not happening. So multiply by two, then add three. Same thing here. If we want to do this, we have to start with this. We have to undo the add three first. So in order to do an undo and add three, the operation that inverses addition is subtraction. So we're going to subtract three. The operation that inverses multiplication is division. And we're going to divide by the same number we multiply. <clears throat> so as I said, the idea is an inverse should undo an action. <clears throat> and now we have this notation and they 
messed up their notation again. This is f of g. So we're composing functions. Two functions f and g are inverses. <clears throat> what does it mean? It means if I plug an x to it, into it, I'm going to get an x out of it. So g does one thing to it. F undoes whatever G does, right? Same thing, right? F does something to it, and then G's going to undo whatever the heck F just did. <clears throat> and this is for all X in the domains of each. So we refer to the inverse function as of F as F inverse. So a quick notation thing. Like what F of X is a sort of notation thing. This does not mean we're multiplying, right? This means we're plugging stuff in. So if you saw like f of 1, it means plugging stuff in for f. If you see an inverse, <clears throat> it does not mean exponents. So if you're thinking f to the inverse, if you're thinking 1 over f, don't think that, right? That's not what it means. This is just a notation. What it means is when I compose this, with my original function, whatever I plug in, I'm gonna get back out. <clears throat> so F does one thing to F, to X, and then F undoes whatever F does. And we get it sort of both ways. F of F, F inverse of F, and F of F inverse of X should both give me back. And so this is the definition but instead of G, I just wrote the F inverse, right? That's what they're saying. <clears throat> so maybe a little bit of a picture too might help a little diagram. We have like our domain and our range. We have an X over here. We have like a Y value over here. So what's happening is my F, when I plug my F, X into my F, it's going to take it to this Y value over here. <clears throat> when I plug in my F inverse, it does whatever the heck my F function just did. It inverses my F. <clears throat> All right. So, now for the following functions find f of g of x and g of f and determine whether the functions f and g are inverses so again if we want to do compositions of functions like f of g of x the first thing you should write out is what the heck this means so f of g of x looks like this so this is the first thing I want to find. I'm also going to find Goff. I'm finding Fog right now. And I want to start sort of from the inside out. So what do I know? What can I see on the inside? I see this thing that looks like G of X. So I know instead of writing G of X, I can write this thing that's called X third X to the X cubed plus one. I was trying to say two things at once, I think there. X to the third or X cubed. F of X cubed plus one <clears throat> is what I want to do now. So I'm going to plug an X cubed plus one into my F function. So my F function looks like a cube root. Everywhere there's an X, instead of X, I'm putting X cubed plus one. And then I have to subtract one. Okay, so you might notice this has a cube root. We have a few things inside the cube root. All these things are being added, subtracted, so I don't really need my parentheses there. They're not really doing a whole lot. So I have x cubed plus one, and then I'm going to subtract one. What I'm going to end up with is something that looks like a cube root of x cubed. And when I see the cube root of x cubed, what am I going to get out of this thing? I'm going to get back my x. And so what did we do? We plugged f of g of x. So we plugged in x to our f of g function. 
and it spitters back out an X. So what that is telling us is that these might be inverses. We're halfway to checking it, right? The other thing we need to check is goth. G of F of X. Instead of fog, I'm going to use goth now. And I'm looking at these functions. I see G of F of X. The first thing you should do is write out what the heck this means. This means G of F of X. So if I write out the definition, I look on the inside, right here, working this thing out right to left. First thing I see is F of X. So I know instead of F of X, I can write this thing called the Q root of X minus one. That's taking place in my F of X. And what this is telling me is I'm plugging a cube root of X minus one into my G function. So everywhere there's an X, like this X cube here, I put in a cube root of X minus one and I have to cube it. And then I have to add one. And if I do this, this is a cube root and it's being cube. These are inverse operations. I'm going to get something like X minus one here plus one. This will also give me an X. And so what I've just demonstrated is that G and F are inverses. So fog of X and golf of X are both going to spit me back an X. These two things are inversing each other. Which hopefully makes sense because if we cube something and add one, the first thing we have to do is subtract one and cube root it. So we have to do things reverse order. And if we look at this one, we would subtract one first and then cube root it. The last thing we did was a cube root. We're going to have to cube it first and then add one. Okay. So you might be able to sort of visually check the thing and, and see if it, it looks sort of like an inverse. So that is a good sort of check, but we definitely want to do the work, right? To double check and make sure we're not just fooling ourselves and thinking something that may not be. Okay, so we look at this thing, f of x equals 2x minus 5, and g of x it looks like a half x plus 5. I have to do fog, I have to do golf, I have to see if it spits me back an X. So this is what I'm looking for to define an inverse. If we plug in an X, it's going to spit back an X. This is from that definition on the previous page. So now we're looking at this thing. We want to find fog, we want to find golf. So if I want to find f of g of x, this is f of g of x. So if I'm looking inside, I'm working this thing out. First thing I see is g of x. So I can plug in g of x is 1 half x plus 5. <clears throat> and I still need to plug that into my f function. So my f function says I take 2 times x. So I want to do 2 times x minus 5. Instead of x, I'm going to write in 1 half x plus 5. And if I do this, you might notice some parentheses here. There's going to be a little bit of distribution. 2 times a half x is a single x plus 10 minus 5. What you might notice is I'm not getting x back here. I'm getting x plus five. What does that mean? Well, they're not inverses is what that means. So we're supposed to figure out if they are inverses. These are not inverses. 
if we look at it, it might be, they might look sort of like they're inverses and they are maybe pretty close. But this is two times X and a minus five. So if I do this and I plugged a number in here, the first thing I would, just, I would do is multiply by two and then minus five. So here, the first thing I do, and I think if you put parentheses around this, it might fix it to be in an inverse. The first thing we have to do is add five and then divide by two. So I could probably fix it so it was an inverse, but the way they gave it one half X plus five is definitely not an inverse. Okay, so now we want to talk about what inverses look like numerically. So F inverse of one is what I'm looking at here. So if you're looking at your X's, you are not looking in the right spot. So if you're telling me two, that's not the correct solution here. What F does, F takes X and it puts it into a Y. What f of x is going to do is it's going to take a y and it's going to give you an x. So what we want to start with is a y value here or an f of x value, which looks like one. And if I plug in one, the thing that matches with one is a negative three. And so if we want to create an inverse table, we're going to swap the input and output data is what they're saying. We're going to swap our X's and Y's. If you want to do the inverse, your X, your Y's become your X's. So minus three, one, two, and four are my Y's. The correlating X's are minus four, minus three, one, and two. And I said it, but that was my, my inverse function it takes my y to my x. So this guy's y's become this guy's x's and this guy's y's become this guy's x's. Okay. The line graph of a bill of data. Two, three, four, five. Oh, okay, they're graphing out, I see. I didn't realize those are even the same points when we went through this. So they're graphing out these points. V f of x. So they're graphing out your f of x. We want to graph out the inverse. So if we wanted to, we could go by this thing point by point. And I think it might be beneficial to do that. So I go minus four, minus three is this first point. The next one is minus three, one. And this is my f of x function. I want to figure out what my inverse function is going to give me. So minus three, one, one, two, and two, four were my t points. And we did it with a table. So if you want to go grab these numbers from the table, you can. But the way we figure out what our new graph is going to be is we swap our x and y coordinates. So if I have minus four, three, I need a minus three, four. I need a one, minus three. I need a two, one. And I need a four, two. So if I go minus three, minus four, I'm going to go one and a minus three. I'm going to go two and one, and I'm going to go four and two. And you might notice in their line graph, we want to make sure this is consecutive points are going to get connected to consecutive points. So we should have a line here between, so between minus three and minus two, or minus three, minus three. Minus 
Okay. Okay. So I think let me let me just throw it on this one again quick. But they are symmetric about something, and it's kind of a weird. It's kind of a weird thing, but if we look at the symmetry. If we look at that 45 degree diagonal, the y equals x line. Your function in the inverse should be symmetric about that. It's easier just to swap the points than to try to figure out symmetry about this thing usually. So I would suggest swapping the points. Evaluate from the graph F inverse of four. So F inverse of four, this is my F inverse over here. And so now this is like an X value that I'm plugging into my inverse. I'm looking over here where my four is. If I plug in four into here, this thing is going to spit me out two. Oh, there's where they say it. Now I see it. Graph the inverse, identify some key points, and swap the coordinates. So here we had a line graph, so all these points were pretty distinct and defined the graph. You might have like a cubic, you might have a square, right, or quad quadratic. It could be any sort of shape out there. What you want to do is you want to grab an X and a Y, grab points off of it that look like it, define it, enough to define it, and then you swap them. All right, so I want to look at these things here. So this is my F over here. I want to do my F inverse function over here. If I look at my domain on this thing, so my domain, I'm going left. How far does this go left? It goes all the way left. How far does this go right? It goes all the way right. On and on to infinity. Now I want to talk about the range. So my range is how far down is this thing going to go? It looks like it has an asymptote right here at minus two. So it's never going to get lower than minus two. It is going to go up. It is going to continue going up. Off to infinity. Okay, so if for my F inverse function, I'm going to swap my X and Y values, what do you think that's going to do to my domain and range? Uh, so let's pull a few points off of this thing and try to graph it, I think, maybe, and then we can talk about them. So we can pull the domain range off of this thing with seeing this. Okay. 2, 4 is one of the points. Another point. <laughs> Excuse me. Another point. Looks like there's going to be zero minus one. Okay, so now I want to think about the points on my F inverse. Become four or two. I'm swapping them. One, one, check this out. If we swap one and one, it still becomes one and one. Uh, zero minus one, it becomes a minus one, zero. And so you might notice one, one is on the axis of symmetry that we talked about. So again, if it's on the axis, it's going to stay on the axis. And hopefully this kind of explains why we get that symmetry about things that are the same, right? So if we're swapping things that are the same, they're going to stay the same. 
And now we're looking at this. We want to graph four comma two. We want to graph one comma one. And I want to graph five one comma zero. Okay, so how is this thing starting to look? You might want to notice this is shooting off to negative infinity in the x direction. So if this shoots off to negative infinity in the x direction, this thing should shoot off to negative infinity in the y direction. And so I mentioned it, but our domain and our range, our x and y values, are swapping. So, so our domain and our range should also swap. If we look at the y-intercept of 0 minus 1, we just did that. It becomes minus 1, 0. And now this thing is probably the last thing that you will need to draw this graph if you can't see it already. So if the horizontal asymptote at y equals 2 instead of y equals it's going to swap my x's and y's. So this is going to become, ooh, sorry, did it in the wrong spot. x equals minus 2 is what it's going to become. And guess what? Horizontal is now going to become a vertical asymptote. And so this shoots off to minus infinity in the x. This should shoot off to minus infinity in the y here. And it's going up and out. If you graph them on the same graph, let's do that real quick. I think it might be beneficial. Or two. There's an asymptote right there. It should look something. Something like that. And hopefully you can see it's symmetry. So this one has a little bit above and a little bit below. It's a little more complicated than that last one we did with the symmetry. So we're flipping this thing. This part comes up. These two things come down here. Okay. Now we want to talk about solving these things symbolically. So if we're solving them symbolically, there are two sort of basic ways that people go about doing this. Uh, so one way is to solve it and then swap it. And then another way is to swap it and solve. Either way, I don't want to use my function notation. I want to get rid of my function notation. I'm just going to say y equals 1 over x plus 2 my original function, I like to swap it first. So I like to swap my y with my x, and my x with my y. Everywhere there's an x, I'm going to put a y. Everywhere where there's a y, I'm putting an x. So I see this. Now this is my inverse. As soon as I do the swap, This is the inversing step. Now, I don't want things solved for x. I want things solved for y. So now I have to solve this thing for y. 1 over y plus 2 equals x. The first thing I should do is subtract 2 from both sides. So I get something like x minus 2 equals 1 over y. This is a little bit weird. There is probably a quick way to think about this. If we put this as a fraction and this is a fraction, we can butterfly this thing. We talked a little bit about that. But we get y times x minus 2 equals 1. There is a cheap trick you can do with things that look like this, too. The next thing we're going to do is divide by this x minus 2. So y equals. 1 over x minus 2. If you have 1 over something and something out here, there's you can actually just swap these two things. 
It's a bit of a cheap trick, but it does work. And we can butterfly it. If you see one over Y, the other thing you can do here, right? And we will get the same thing. So there are a few different ways you can do this. Is that you might maybe notice you have to multiply everything by a Y to get rid of that, which will take you to this step here. Okay. So I get this thing that looks like y equals one over x minus two. If you put this, you're oh so close. There's just the one little interesting thing. They're asking you about an inverse function. So my inverse function should look like one over x minus two. That is my that should be your solution. Okay, so I have now a formula, they're giving me a real formula to convert, this formula converts temperature in degrees centigrade to degrees Fahrenheit, find the inverse. So we want to solve this thing for centigrade. So I don't really like the fact that they threw this in the section too much, but it might be good because maybe you need to know, like if we're, this is Fahrenheit and this is centigrade, these are variables are actually already defined, right? And to find the inverse, all I really need to do is solve for C. I don't need to swap these. If you're swapping them, then you're swapping what centigrade and Fahrenheit are, and you don't want to do that. So it's a bit of an odd problem to throw in here when we're trying to show you to swap and solve things. But here we're actually not going to swap. We're just going to solve. So if we want to solve for Celsius, First thing we have to do is subtract 32. So F minus 32 will give me my 9 fifths C. And now I got to multiply by what? Five ninths to both sides. So five ninths, F minus 32 will give me my C. I should probably write with the C leading five nights. And if you wrote this, if you did, if you distribute it, it's a fine. It doesn't need to be too much. That's fine with me. Five nights F minus 32. Okay. That is. Number one. Now they're going to give us, are these, ooh, self-inverses. I thought they were giving me a student activity sometime soon, but I guess not. Why are they self-inverses? And what does a self-inverse mean? Well, it means when you compose it with itself, it is an inverse, right? So we had this thing in F of F inverse, right, or F of G if we call F and G inverses, if we plug it in, it's gonna give us back X, whether we do fog or whether we do golf, it should work, right? We were doing this previously. Now, instead of F and G, we're gonna do this with G and G. So if we do GOG, GOG of X, I wanna write out what this means. This means G of G of X, And now I'm thinking about this. My G of X is the thing that looks like six over X. And I wanna plug in six over X into something that looks like six over X. So this is six over six over X. This is six divided by six over X or six being multiplied by X over six, which is X. So this demonstrates that it is its own inverse, right? But if we look at this, right? Six divided by a number. Why is that its own inverse? If you have to, y equals what? Six over x. 
basically what they're telling us is two numbers are multiplying together into six, right? So if I take six and plug in a number for X, like two, six divided by two is gonna give me three. And then when I go six divided by three, it's gonna spit me back two. So this is the like sort of product quotient thing, right? If we have two numbers that are multiplying to a number, we divide by one, it's gonna give us the other, it's gonna give us the quotient, but it's gonna give us the other multiple, right? These two things are multiplying to get to here. We divide by this, we're gonna get this one. We divide by this one, we're gonna get back to the original number. Similar things might be happening here, right? If we subtract a number, x minus three, plug a number in there. X minus three is gonna give you five. All right, now we're gonna take five and we're gonna subtract it from eight. X, eight minus five gives me back the three, right? So two numbers adding up to eight is what we can think here. But if we wanna prove it, H of H of X, that this is an inverse, what we're expecting is that this will be X. So the definition looks like H of H of X. I look on the inside here, I do H of eight minus X. Now I'm plugging in eight minus X into my X, eight minus eight minus X. I have to do a little bit of distribution, but eight minus eight plus X is going to give me back my X. All right, so that is the first section over inverses. There is a little tidbit, a little more that we're gonna talk about in 5.2b now. 5.2b or not to be, that is the question. One to one. All right, so we wanna think about, does every function have an inverse? And maybe to note here, when our book uses the word inverse, they really, really mean, does it have an inverse function? Is the inverse itself also a function, right? They are defining inverses as f and g both being functions. So you word of caution, like other books, and I've studied other stuff, they can have inverse relations. This book acts like those don't even exist. Like inverses don't exist unless they are functions in this book. So with that said, we want to think, does every function have an inverse? If the function T of H gives the temperature as a function of our, find the following. So T inverse of 68. Okay. So we might notice that T itself is a function, right? If we take 10, 11, 12, we're never going to repeat an X here. So we're never going to have different X's, or sorry, the same X with different Y's, right? Each time is going to give me a unique temperature. But if we look the other way around, we want to look at T inverse of 68. I see a 68 there and I see a 68 there. So T inverse of 68, it looks like I'm doing 12 o'clock. And it looks like it's also happening at what, eight o'clock? I'm getting two things for this. I guess I can probably write this as just one o'clock, right? Or one, one function, probably. Well, let's do that. Either way is correct. So we're getting two things when we plug 68 into our inverse. So what does that mean about the inverse? It means it's not a function here. So this would be a, like an example of an inverse relation, but it's not a function, right? A function is one-to-one -one if different inputs always result in different outputs. So uh, I think they say it later. Yeah, I don't see it on here. Uh, so 
Okay, so what that basically means is that this is not one to one. So what what is synonymous with one to one is saying the inverse is also a function. And since we're getting two different values for our inverse, this one is not one to one. So when we try to determine if something was a function, we looked at our x quantities. We looked to see if any of our x quantities repeated and gave us different y's. If we want to look at whether our inverse is a function or whether we want to look at whether the function is one to one, we want to look at whether our y's repeat. And so there were two ways. For every x, and then we're going to say the same thing all the other way around to call it one to one. So for every y, there is a unique x. And so going back to our sort of diagram thing, right? One to one really means that I have one X, I can take it to my Y, I can take it back to my X, right? I don't have things splitting off like this, right? There's no like y1, y2 sort of thing happening here, two different quantities of y's, and there's not two different quantities of x's being connected to one y. I don't get these branching off sort of things. What it means is I have a unique relationship Every X gives me a unique Y and every Y gives me a unique X. And so I can go here and here. And this is a function. My F is a function. My F inverse is also a function. So it is a unique sort of pairing that is happening. It's what this one to one means. For every one X, I get one Y. For every one Y, I get one X. And so that's why they're calling this thing one to one. If we do it with this, right? Whew. This is, F is not a function. I have an X and I don't know what the heck I'm gonna get out of it. It could give me this, it could give me that. So this is not one-to-one -one, cause F is not a function already. And then this would be the opposite, right? If, if I'm talking about my inverse, my inverse here is not a function. So these things are not one-to-one -one, definitely, right? One to one means we got a unique pairing. None of these things are going to split off, right? My F is going to take me directly to a unique at Y. It's not going to do a splitting thing because this would mean my F is not a function. My Y is gonna take me directly back to my X and not to multiple X's like it did with the temperature, right? So <laughs> the next question, how can you tell if a function to find numerically is one to one. Okay, so this was not one to one. And it was not one to one because it had a repeating y value. So if you look at your repeating no y value, or you shouldn't see one, right? <laughs> no repeating y value. So when we look for a function, we look for no repeating x value. Now, if we want to know if the function is one to one, we look for no repeating y value. Okay, so when we talked about a function and we talked about whether something was a function, the test we used was to see if two points fell vertically or the vertical line test. So if you want to know whether f is a function, we use the vertical line test. If you want to know if the inverse is a function, we're swapping our x's and our y's. So now we're going kind of the other direction. We don't want our y's to repeat. 
So what they they just jump to it, but this, here's a graphical example, and they tell you the horizontal line test. Is it possible to draw a horizontal line that intersects the graph of the function more than once? The function is not one to one. So we're looking along here. It's safe like up in here, but when I get to like right about there, right? If I draw a horizontal line, boom and boom, it's gonna hit it twice. This is not one to one. So sometimes they say one to one with a one dash one. One to one. And that's the one to one bar. Sorry. Okay. They probably won't even be around by the time I get done making this video. Okay. So uh if it is possible to draw a horizontal line that intersects the graph of a function more than once, the function is not one to one. So can we draw a horizontal line here that intersects the graph more than once? Eh, it like almost levels out here, but it doesn't quite level out. It keeps going down, keeps going down. There is no way I'm seeing that you're gonna draw a horizontal line. The other thing I didn't ask is, if, is, is the original thing a function? This is a function, right? We can do the vertical line on these. These are both functions. But this one is not one-to-one. -one. This is one-to-one. -one. Okay. This is a function one-to-one. -one. So, yeah, yeah that's uh, the, the best way to do these is to think about what the graph looks like. If we know the basic shape of the graph, I know this has like some transformations. It's going to move it to the right seven or something, right? But the basic shape of the graph you should have in your mind is it looks like a V. It's an absolute value. This, oh man, I hope you know what first order linear equations look like at this point. That's gonna look like a straight line. This, the picture I have in my head, it's going to move it like, up and down, left and right, stretch it, shrink it, but it looks like an inverted parabola. So now I wanna think of the function is one-to-one. -one. So I'm doing a horizontal line test. So if we do your horizontal line, it's gonna hit it twice. This is not one-to-one. -one. If I do a horizontal line, if you can draw me a horizontal line hitting this thing more than once, I'll probably pay you some money for it, but I don't think it's gonna happen. Uh, it is a point, right? So this is one-to-one. -one. It's a linear function. And I think we had a linear function where we found an inverse. It is a linear function. If you find an inverse to a linear function, it gives you another line. What about this? So a parabola, whether it's inverted or whether it's upside, upside down or right side up, I can always draw a horizontal line that hits it twice. So parabolas are not one-to-one. -one. Okay. So the inverse of a parabola. If we think about the inverse of a parabola, right, right, like y equals x squared is my parabola. The inverse of it, or I guess I should say this is my f of x. My inverse, right? If I want to think about my inverse parabolas, I think you know there's got to be a positive half of that thing and there's got to be a negative half, right, of your parabola. So this is also indicate that my inverse is not a function when I think about parabolas. There's a really cheap trick that sometimes mathematicians do. And this is a little added extra bonus if you want to tune out, I guess you can. But sometimes we only look at half the parabola. And so we'll say something like y equals x squared or x squared is greater than or equal to zero. Because if we do that, if we restrict the domain, now we do have a sort of one-to-one -one relationship. <laughs> so there are sort of ways to get around certain things and you can use your math tool belt to sort of get there. But in general, right, what I was trying to get at is parabolas aren't going to be one-to-one um, -one because we have our inverses and not going to give us a function. Okay, and we draw up. 
you drop the inverse of those two halves, this is not a function. All right, so that is it for this section. That is enough pages for now, I think. Uh, study hard, get this stuff down. We're almost there. It's getting close to the end of the